Hello, everyone. I'm Liz Wishnick, a Senior Research Scientist at CNA and Rice Fellow at the East-West Center. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second in our series of virtual dialogues about um, U.S. Indo-Pacific partners and the Arctic. Uh, today's session, uh, we are addressing Singapore and uh, how Singapore views the Arctic and how it partners with Canada and the United States in the Arctic. And uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting dialogue. Singapore has so much to contribute to the Arctic and has had in its uh, decade of participation in the Arctic Council, um, achieved uh, a number of uh, significant forms of participation. And so we're so pleased to have two experts from Singapore uh, to uh, talk about this with us. So, so this project on uh, US Indo-Pacific partners in the Arctic builds on uh, the East-West Center's um, North Pacific Arctic Initiative that began in uh, 2011, headed by the former President Charles Morrison, which has brought together uh, a diverse group of specialists uh, from uh, the North Pacific Arctic, from Japan and South Korea, and uh, United States, Canada, uh, Russia, uh, to discuss uh, that part of the Arctic. So this project is broadening the discussion to include uh, US Indo-Pacific partners in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So this week we're talking about Singapore and next week we'll discuss India, the US and the Arctic. So our first speaker today is Dr. Hima Nadaraja, Program Manager for Southeast Asia with the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. She has a PhD in international relations from the University of British Columbia, where she researched governance, Arctic, the Arctic, climate change, and outer space. Um, so uh, I will introduce the second panelist but before he speaks, uh, Dr. Christopher Lin. So Dr. Nadaraja, please begin our, our discussion. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Liz. Uh, morning, afternoon, uh, evening, everyone. Uh, and thanks again, Liz and, and, and Troy for organizing the series of virtual dialogues. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of this, looking forward uh, to what I'm sure is gonna be a very insightful discussion later. So I thought maybe I would start with a bit of a background uh, in Singapore's interest in the Arctic and how it has engaged in the region before providing some brief thoughts on uh, its role in the Arctic given recent geopolitical shifts. And you know, um, I'll get into the intersection with Canada after Chris. So Singapore was admitted into the Arctic Council as an observer in 2013, uh, alongside other Asian states, China, India, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, it's a small island observer state and unquestionably a unique entity within the Arctic sphere. It's about 140 times smaller than the smallest Arctic Council member state, Iceland. And it's about 7,000 kilometers away from the Arctic Circle in equatorial Southeast Asia. And unlike the rest of the Asian observers, the city state does not, did not really have a scientific or exploratory uh, history in the Arctic. Um, and regardless of this seemingly outlier nature, it's built a reputation of upholding uh, and advocating a robust international legal regime inside and outside of the Arctic context. It has also managed to portray itself as a benign yet valuable member in its regional participation, as well as in playing a pivotal role in translating solutions between regions and countries. So why is it interested in the Arctic and why does it continue to be? Now, this interest is not just academic or peripheral. Uh, it is a strategic engagement driven by profound implications of climate change, as well as emerging opportunities in the Arctic region. So the first being climate change. Uh, today, global warming will cause about a 27 centimeter rise in sea levels. Uh, and that's a result of just melting, the melting of only 3.3% of total volume of Greenland's ice sheets. Uh, almost a third of Singapore is less than five meters above sea levels, uh, above uh, sea level. And so a significant water level rise from a warming Arctic will pose an existential threat to the island state. So it's been participating in Arctic climate research. It aims to contribute to global climate science, advocate for sustainable and environmental policies, and ensure that it can effectively mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. The second, maritime and shipping. 
So we all know melting Arctic ice is opening uh, new shipping routes, the Northern Sea Route, for instance, which will significantly shorten travel distance between Asia and Europe compared to traditional routes uh, such as through the Swiss Canal. Singapore is a major global maritime hub. It's interested in these developments to enhance its strategic position in global shipping and trade networks. It stands to benefit from shorter and potentially more cost-effective shipping routes between Asia, but it also uh, is interested in the development of uh, new ports. So how has it engaged uh, in the Arctic since uh, 2013? It's largely a promoted a two-pronged approach in the North to assist in any way possible within the Arctic Council and the region itself, and to gain a better understanding of how changes in the Arctic may affect the island state. So for Singapore, the key to being viewed as a benign actor has been consistent trust building and active engagement, not just in the years it spent advocating for admission to the council, but also since its admission. So it's uh, uh, actively engaged in track uh, to diplomacy, for instance, and consistently demonstrated its commitment to um, participating in regional activities. It's also shown a preference to work directly with Arctic states rather than with other observer states. It likely recognizes that it can maximize its interest in the Arctic by working directly with member states. As, um, and this is likely because it has a bit less of a historical engagement with the region. So it's been engaging uh, since it's uh, uh, getting its observer status in 2013, been very active with uh, engagements with Norway, Finland, Canada, and the US, working with the embassies, holding various events and workshops on the Arctic. Now, how do we see uh, Singapore's role in a changing Arctic? Since its admission, Singapore has often been referred to as the unlikely candidate, the odd one out, it's an Arctic novice, but it's really time to move beyond such a narrative uh, for non-regional observer states for several reasons, including the fact that it's been now nearly a decade since the Asian states were observers, admitted as observers. Now, during this time, states have made countless engagements within the, with the region, and the concept of Arctic exceptionalism, of course, has come under increased uh, scrutiny. Now, the Arctic, we know, is not a discrete and isolated entity in international relations. What happens in the Arctic does not remain in the Arctic, as we so often hear, and nor is the region unaffected by events elsewhere. So scholarship on observer states needs to move beyond a perspective that questions their role in a compartmentalized region to one that examines their engagement in a globalized Arctic that's in flux. Uh, we are observing several shifts in the Arctic, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which gravely violated international law. Uh, and of course, in recent years, deepening cooperation between Russia and China, including within the Arctic has been observed, causing some what of a trepidation among regional states. So maybe I'll end it here and uh, pass it on to uh, Chris. Uh, thank you, Hima, uh, Dr. Nadaraja. That was excellent. And so our second speaker is uh, Dr. Christopher Len, who is a visiting senior fellow at the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. He's staying up very late for us, so we thank him uh, for that. Um, he is an Asia specialist with two decades of, of experience uh, covering international energy politics, uh, sustainable sustainability issues with a focus on um, Asia and the Arctic. And he has a PhD from the Center for Energy, Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy from the University of Dundee in Scotland. So we are so uh, privileged to have Dr. Len speak to us about energy issues and Singapore's role in the Arctic. Okay, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to make this uh, presentation. So uh, to start with, uh, I would say that I'm not an Arctic expert, the way scholars and policy analysts from the Arct Arctic countries are experts. Uh, coming from Singapore, I would say that Singapore adds value by contextualizing Arctic developments in the global context. So the basic question we always ask here, and this is something I ask myself a lot, is what can we do to contribute to the sustainable development of the Arctic? There's that very cliche saying, whatever happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. This is often said as a warning to the world in not, in not ignoring the challenges the Arctic is facing. 
But I'd like to spin this statement into a more positive note. What does the Arctic offer that can contribute to the sustainable development of the wider world, including here in tropical Southeast Asia? So compared to the mainstream media's emphasis on the impact of climate change on the Arctic and its global effects, the role of the Arctic in the context of the global energy transition has not received as much attention as it should. Here, I refer to the Arctic's role in facilitating international energy security and in supporting the global energy security agenda. First, we can look at the Arctic through the lens of natural resource development. The Arctic is traditionally a major provider of fossil fuels, but it also has a huge potential in supplying critical minerals and rare earths needed for the development of new low carbon energy systems. But of course, the proper governance frameworks must be in place before any development takes place. Second, technological advances in renewable energy and smart energy solutions, as well as constant efforts to improve energy governance have positive enabling effects for remote communities all over the world including those in the Arctic and Southeast Asia. So here I note that there is a lot of work done in the research and development of energy systems in the Arctic region. I'm talking about the universities up north conducting lab research, the deploying and prototyping of new and improved energy systems in the Arctic fields and within Northern communities. Besides equipment, Another important dimension is the Arctic community's contribution to energy governance discussions towards sustainable energy solutions and in developing resilient remote energy communities. So here I focus on remote energy systems, which are basically localized systems that supply power to remote areas, which is not connected to a centralized grid. Remote communities face high barriers of entry in the deployment and operation of these energy systems, given the harshness of the local environment and rising transaction costs. First, equipment would have to be transported over difficult terrain and long distance across remote areas. Second, given the harsh environment, the equipment would need to be more robust and resilient to withstand the challenging local conditions. Third, there may be design modification requirements to facilitate on-site repairs given costly transportation costs. Fourth, the local community staff would have to be trained to operate, service, and repair such equipment. Fifth, energy service providers to remote communities would also need the social license to operate. So this requires proper community engagement frameworks to be in place. Again, what ever happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So a rugged and reliable energy system that works in the hostile Arctic environment should be able to work anywhere else in the world. Likewise, energy governance solutions tested with remote communities in the Arctic should also bear important lessons, be they failures or successes for the rest of the world. So here, I'm not taking a direct I'm not talking about a direct application or transplant of whatever is happening in the Arctic. And even, uh, for example, in the Arctic, you need power for heating. In the tropics, in Southeast Asia, we need power for cooling, right? And a key to success in implementation is to be mindful of the local conditions everywhere. Even within the Arctic, there isn't a single size fits all solution. So the main point I'd like to get across is that in terms of building resilient technology and accumulating knowledge in energy governance, the Arctic has an important contribution to make. And here is where Singapore has been helping in our little own way. In this context, I have convened meetings for energy experts for the Arctic and Southeast Asian communities to meet here in Singapore. We have organized two events, one in 2016, one in 2018, for the participants from the two regions to learn from one another. This is in a way a creation of a new, I guess, epi 
epistemic community uh, between two very distinct regions. And uh, it's very interesting when you bring the people together because they actually have a lot to talk about in common. So I will not dive too deep into the specific events, but for those who are interested, you can contact me and I would be happy to send you the relevant event publications. So when we think about the Arctic, we should not think about it merely as a resource base, but as a frontier for energy innovation and an important contributor to the global energy governance framework. And in this regard, I think uh, the Arctic and Southeast Asia have a lot to learn from one another. And Singapore has been uh, trying to facilitate this process. Um, one more point I'd like to add, and that is something that's quite specific to uh, Singapore, uh, Singapore's interest in the Arctic. At the diplomatic level, I would say that um, Singapore is not a stranger to the Arctic Council members' states. There have already been existing relations that predates Singapore's joining of the Arctic Council. But in joining the Arctic Council as an observer, I think it's useful for Singapore because it adds a new dimension of engagement with these uh, countries at the bilateral level. And uh, Singapore is always interested to be engaged in international affairs. Uh, we are a very small country and we need as many friends as we can. We try to make our voices, our voice heard on international platforms. And the Arctic Council is one platform where we feel we can make meaningful contribution. And I think that is one of the key reasons why uh, Singapore has been participating in Arctic Council activities as an observer uh, so actively over the past decade or so. So I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Len. Uh, so now we're going to come back uh, to Dr. Nadaraja, who's going to share some thoughts about the opportunities uh, for Canada's engagement uh, with Southeast Asia and the Arctic. And before I turn the floor over to her, I just want to uh, issue a few more thank yous uh, to Troy Buffard uh, and, Zoe, and Zoe Weaver, um, Troy from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Zoe Weaver from the East West Center for managing the uh, organization of this event to uh, Dr. Nicholas Hamasevich from the East West Center, who is the director of the program that's sponsoring it, and Dr. Cameron Carlson, a dean of the School of Business at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And while uh, uh, Hema is talking, uh, I want you to listen to her carefully, but also think of some questions you might have uh, for our discussion, which you can uh, write in the Q&A uh, tab uh, on the, below your screen. So, uh, Dr. Thanks, Liz. Um, so, I'm going to shift it a little bit to Canada. Uh, now, the government of Canada released its uh, long-awaited Indo-Pacific strategy in November 2022. Uh, it represents a commitment to deepening engagement with the dynamic and rapidly growing um, activities across the Indo-Pacific. Now, the direct geopolitical linkages between uh, Asia and the Arctic are highlighted in the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, uh, which sees the Arctic as a region of opportunity. Now, as part of the strategy, the need for responsible and sustainable engagement uh, with uh, the Arctic uh, is made clear. The Canadian Arctic is in need of uh, innovative energy, shipping, and telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, we all know uh, climate change is accelerating the impacts on biodiversity. There is an energy crisis. So collaborative efforts are needed to ensure sustainable development of the North, um, which is growing more and more critical. Now, Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy reaffirms its commitment to maintaining peace and stability in the Arctic, as well as the health and safety of Indigenous Northern communities. And it presents an opportunity to address these issues while also deepening its engagement in Asia. The intersection of Singapore's Arctic interests and Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy highlights the potential for collaboration. Both sides can leverage their strengths and uh, shared values to address common challenges in, in um, the Arctic and uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. 
So firstly, on the environmental front, Singapore and Canada can and should collaborate to collaborate on Arctic research initiatives, share knowledge and expertise, better understand climate change, develop innovative solutions for sustainability, as we just heard Chris talk about uh, on energy as well. Um, second, in the realm of maritime trade, uh, Canada and Singapore should be exploring partnerships to enhance connectivity between the two regions. Infrastructure investment is uh, extremely important in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, which uh, is quite different uh, across the uh, Atlantic and the European Arctic. Uh, so we need more investments in infrastructure, technology, foster regulatory harmonizations, uh, you know, for smoother, more efficient trade routes, build uh, more efficient ports as well. So lastly, in terms of geopolitical strategy, Canada and Singapore should be strengthening their cooperation in not just the Arctic Council, but also within ASEAN the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So in 2023, Canada established a strategic partnership with ASEAN. So by promoting a rule-based international order, advocating for inclusive economic growth, ensuring regional security, both nations can play a more pivotal role in building a resilient and sustainable uh, Arctic and Indo-Pacific region. And of course, underlying all of this, uh, and it goes without saying, the inclusion of indigenous people of the Arctic is incredibly important. Um, Singapore does not have a, a specific or uh, 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 fully uh, uh, formalized uh, Arctic policy, um, and unlike most of the other observer states, uh, but its strategy has been uh, fairly inclusive. And in you know, in uh, moving forward, it needs to continue ensuring that the bedrock of its regional policy is focused on indigenous inclusion and consultation. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that that uh, that sets us up very well for an interesting discussion. So uh, again, I urge the audience uh, to think of some questions to write in the Q and A, and uh, some of you will also be promoted to panelists at, at the end of this half hour to engage further in an expert discussion. So. Don't be surprised if you find yourself in a new room in a half an hour. Um, uh, so I would like to start off with a question for each of the panelists. Um, the first one is to Dr. Nataraja. Um, so you made the point that uh, Singapore wants to engage directly with the Arctic states. And what I find so interesting about uh, Singapore and the Arctic is that uh, it, it has such a different uh, way of, of engaging than China, uh, for example. So China has come out with its Arctic um, policy statement, calls itself a near Arctic state, and Singapore very humbly calls itself a, no a novice uh, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, so uh, how, how has Singapore's approach been received, do you think, in the Arctic? Uh, is Singapore's uh, direct engagement finding resonance in the region? Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, I think Singapore is very well aware it is not an Arctic state. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think Chris had mentioned this earlier. Uh, it sees what value it can add. Um, and it has spent a lot of its uh, years since uh, becoming an observer state in uh, engaging directly with Arctic states, really building that trust as well. Uh, and that's paid off. Um, so it's, uh, and you know, it doesn't just engage within the Arctic Council working groups. It's often uh, a very familiar uh, participant in Arctic frontiers. Uh, in Norway, it's uh, very um, um, consistent in, in uh, attending the Arctic Circle Assembly in Iceland. And it often sends, uh, at the time, its senior Arctic official who is now Canada's uh, non-resident ambassador, uh, Mr. Sam Tan, to these events, uh, consistently engaging. Uh, so it doesn't, um, it hasn't been uh, a one-off thing. Uh, so I think that has been a very, very crucial uh, factor in the way it's been engaging with uh, the Arctic states. And it has been doing so with each Arctic state. Um, and you know, likewise in Singapore, it's been engaging with its various embassies, uh, 
conducting events, holding workshops and seminars. And it does a lot of this, these, uh, these events because it also knows it's not an Arctic state. And a lot of it is, is really uh, grounded in the fact that it wants to learn, a, learn more about the Arctic and find ways of how it can best contribute to the region as well. Uh, can I add something here? Sure, please. Yes, I mean, um, Kima has talked about uh, Singapore's engagement with the Arctic uh, member states, Arctic Council member states. But I think that's quite a substantial engagement with the Arctic Council itself. We try to make ourselves relevant by turning up at working groups. Uh, we try to see how we can work with the Arctic counterparts to do something meaningful. And the basic premise is it must be something that we are familiar with, somehow where we can contribute as, an, as a country or as a as a nation outside the, uh, the Arctic region. So uh, we have been attending the Arctic Council meetings. We have been participating in the Emergency Preparedness Prevention and Response Working Group, uh, EPPR. Uh, also, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, CAF. Uh, protection of the Arctic Marine Environment, PAM. Uh, Sustainable Development Working Group, SDWG. So you can see that although um, in a way compared to big countries, uh, the diplomatic resources of our country is somewhat limited. Uh, we do try to be diligent and uh, proactive in trying to find ways to work with the Arctic Council. Yeah. Uh, just a uh... Since you're you're in the spotlight to follow up with you on an energy question, uh, it's so interesting in your presentation how you showed that the Arctic is a source of opportunity. Because typically we think of the the threat multiplier of climate change in the in the Arctic uh, and its impact on sea level rise and and, and other uh, issues for especially for island states. Uh, but you talked about opportunities. So I wonder how did Singapore um, realize these opportunities? Was this um, a was this a reason for Singapore's decision to join the Arctic Council as as an observer, or was this uh, the effect of being a part of the the Arctic Council and trying to find some uh, form of synergy? Um, I guess. There are two parts to my response. First, I wear my academic hat, right? So um, there has been talk about a globalized Arctic, right? Um, and I think Singapore is always trying to refresh its network and to sort of actively scan the horizon for global developments that will or that may potentially impact the state's survival. And I guess at the early stages of uh, maybe in the 2000s, there's been increasing talk about the opening up of the Arctic maritime routes. And to some extent, uh, the media has been hyping up this thing, talking about whether with the opening up of the Arctic route, uh, the Malacca Straits and Singapore's status as a maritime hub uh, may be affected. So I think that is one of the reasons, and I'm speaking in my personal capacity, of course, I uh, this is my own analysis. I think um, the Singapore government was also mindful that, that the Arctic uh, maritime shipping routes are opening up. Uh, and the basic question they're asking that, uh, themselves is how will it affect Singapore's maritime hub status? And second, as a maritime nation, are there opportunities we can tap on? We are so small, we have no hinterland. Uh, so we look internationally for places which can sort of serve as uh, offshore uh, distant hinterlands. We try to grow our companies and beyond Singapore, we look for international opportunities. And with the opening up of the Arctic, yeah, there are some questions about whether uh, the Arctic will eat our lunch. But I think in the context of 
uh, the policymakers, they are also actively trying to find opportunities for our companies to grow. So uh, that is that uh, basis uh, for Singapore to get increasingly interested in the Arctic Council. Right. And we are, we are from a tropical country. Uh, it's not, does not come across as a natural fit. Um, in a way, uh, government to government relations are very good. But when it comes to looking and identifying things to work on, uh, to a large extent, uh, they do reach out to the researchers, the academics, the think tanks, the educational institutions to try to work with them to explore opportunities to engage with the Arctic counterparts. So coming back to the basic question, uh, is... Uh, Singapore's uh, thinking in joining the Arctic Council um, and the way it is participating in the Arctic Council, um, how should I put it? How is Singapore's engagement with the Arctic Council defined? I think partly there is a clear uh, national survival issue there. Second, they are looking for uh, business opportunities. Third, in the context of people-to-people -people exchange, uh, this is where a lot of the engagement is actually taking place. I mean, you can have, have all the government-to-government -government, uh, engagement. If nothing meaningful happens at the economic level, at the people-to-people -people level, at the cultural level, there's no meaning for such engagement. It's just the government officials talking to themselves. Thank you. Uh, I see we have one question in the Q&A. Before we get to it, I feel compelled to ask a question about the context because this project was developed uh, to see how the U.S. might engage with Indo-Pacific partners given uh, the war in Ukraine and the deepening China-Russia partnership. So I have one question about that for both panelists. Um, so we've just seen the Shangri-La dialogue in taking place in Singapore, a lot of pushback against China uh, towards uh, activities in the South China Sea and, uh, and elsewhere. And we have the context of the sanctions on Russia uh, for its war in Ukraine. Uh, Singapore had some joint ventures with Russia. The Koppel uh, company had a joint venture. And the, another company, Red Box, was sanctioned for uh, its continued tra trade ties to Russia. So um, is Singapore thinking about this context of the China-Russia partnership as it looks to the Arctic, or is this not a relevant factor as Singapore outlines its interests in, in this region? Um, who, who should go first, Hima? Whoever would like to go first. Uh, maybe uh, Hima will go first. Sure, yeah. Um, I feel like maybe Chris might be better positioned to answer this, but from, my understanding, as I've mentioned, I think Singapore's interest in the Arctic has really been uh, at a bilateral level. So it, it deepens, it, it seeks to deepen its engagement directly with Arctic member states. Of course, with Russia, that's been uh, somewhat on a hold since uh, with the sanctions and since uh, the onset of the war. But I think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, as most Southeast Asian states, uh, you know, there's this constant need to to balance its uh, interests uh, when it comes to, <clears throat> let's say, U.S.-China rivalry as well. Um, so I think um, on the Arctic, Singapore would seem to be a little, of course, it's concerned with the geopolitical shifts that we are seeing. Uh, there is also some uh, observers out there who who say that the uh the collaboration with it, with Russia and and China uh on the Arctic is is uh, a little overemphasized um so I think it might be taking a wait and see approach but it's uh, if anything it's going to be seeing how it can deepen its engagement with its uh, other allies uh in the Arctic so mainly with the U.S. Canada Norway uh and so on. Um, okay, so uh, from my point of view, uh, what I can see is uh, since the uh, 
Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, obviously, uh, Singapore has come out to make a very strong statement against the invasion. So that has inevitably affected bilateral relations. Um, but I will also say that um, Singapore is not an active player in the geostrategic sense when we are thinking about the Arctic. We are very much looking at it from the point of view of uh, business opportunities and maybe some law of the sea issues. If there are new kinds of uh, regulations, uh, laws, uh, Singapore may want to make sure that they are consistent with existing uh, law of the sea uh, uh, laws. Uh, and uh, the other point is that I know that the Arctic Council, when a lot of the Asian observers were admitted, there was some degree of suspicion about their motivations in wanting to join the Arctic Council, whether they are trying to uh, muscle in to have a say in a region which the Arctic Council member states think should be discussed within the, the, the member states themselves. So Singapore is also extremely mindful about that. We stay out of the politics of uh, the Arctic Council. And you can see from my presentation, the emphasis is very much about how we can help the Arctic member states, how we can facilitate the Arctic Council in reaching out in the context of sustainable development, in the context of facing uh, common threats such as climate change, we don't take sides. We have very good bilateral relations with all the members. We, I don't think, to my personal knowledge, we have been asked to take sides in the context of what's happening in the Arctic space. And to be honest, uh, we have such a small presence there that uh, what exactly would they like us to do, right? So I'll, I'll end here for now. Thank you very much. And so now I want to turn to our uh, question uh, from Jonathan Martin. Uh, do you think that Singapore will produce a formal policy or strategy document for the Arctic as many other observer states have done in recent years? Um, I'll, oh, yeah, Kima, go ahead. Please. Go ahead. You go oh, okay. Ahead. <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to say that I uh, I remember I wrote a, uh, uh, an op-ed on this uh, about six years ago on uh, Singapore's lack of uh, an Arctic policy. And I'll be honest, I don't think much has changed. Um, uh, I don't think, um, so it seems to believe that, you know, articulating an official policy uh, may not be the only way for it to, to for a state to really legitimize its position in the Arctic. Uh, and I think uh, what Singapore has done is prefer to, it prefers to, for its actions and efforts and, and its engagement in the region to really take precedence. Uh, we should also maybe point out that some other observer policies have not really gone down very smoothly. Um, so for instance, with China calling, of course, itself a near Arctic state, uh, it does little to really allay any suspicions uh, of uh, its intentions in the region. So a policy may not really be the, or at least having a formal policy may not really be necessary. Um, and I think what Singapore has done is really work on uh, engaging through various means, not just within the Arctic Council, but through other means uh, in the Arctic, um, to, to try to add its value. So uh, I don't uh, think uh, I see itself uh, necessarily producing a formal policy uh, yet. Yeah. Uh, likewise, I don't see uh, it producing a formal policy document. And I also don't think this is the way the Singapore government uh, works. Um, we focus on real engagement rather than policy documents. Um, and the role of the Singapore government, as I understand it, is they try to facilitate other actors when they want to get things done, but they're not trying to direct them to do things, 
right? So if there are companies that are seeking to invest, uh, the Singapore government will try their best to try to facilitate meetings, uh, to try to provide information, uh, try to invite relevant people to come over to Singapore to meet with the right people in Singapore. Uh, so it takes a sort of a soft approach uh, when engaging with uh, the um, there is the Arctic Council members and there is the Arctic Council. I see them as two very separate forms of engagement, right? So at the Arctic Council level is very much government to government. Uh, at the uh, bilateral level, there are all kinds of engagements that are already ongoing so that I don't feel there's a need for very specific uh, document. Uh, with the Arctic Council member states. With regards to the Arctic Council, uh, there are a lot of speeches that quite clearly lay out the, the thinking of the Singapore government. And in, in this sense, there isn't a need for a very specific national or policy documents with uh, targets, uh, with uh, very specific policy directives. Uh, maybe I can answer that first. Um, I, I think that in Singapore and Southeast Asia, obviously we have a different uh, relationship with China as compared to the US. Uh, we are sort of their near neighbors. Uh, there's a history of engagement. Uh, it's sort of like a very good economic relations. Uh, there are still some apprehensions among some circles about the future direction of uh, China, uh, future intentions of China in Southeast Asia. But all I'll say uh, is that Singapore and the Southeast Asian countries would like to keep Southeast Asia and all parts of the world open and free for trade uh, we don't want any single dominant player to control a region to lock it up. So uh, we are a trading nation. We want to be able to trade and have friendly relations with everybody. Um, we are too small to play the strategic game. Uh, we have always been asked to choose sides, but it's very difficult for us to do so. Uh, the side we choose is our own Singapore side. We just want to make sure that there is a peaceful regional environment uh, and that the political and economic space of Singapore is protected, whatever happens in the wider world. And these are based on principles of international law and uh, diplomatic, uh, non-violent uh, uh, so peaceful solutions to difficult uh, challenges. So uh, in, in, in one sentence, I guess uh, we are not trying to push out China from the region, but we want to make sure that it remains a responsible party uh, when it engages Southeast Asia, right? It's more like uh, we want it to play a role as a big tree that provides shade we don't want it to be a shadow that casts across the region. So it's a difficult balancing act. And I think that both the Americans and the Chinese, they understand Southeast Asia better these days. Um, that um, it's not likely that we will be taking sides. At least that's how, how I'm looking at it. Um, yeah, just to add on to that, um, Singapore is is a small very open economy so yes it is you know it, it would want uh to to keep driving for a rules-based international order but having said that there was an interesting survey that actually came out of uh dr lan's uh, institute the south of uh, isis uh where uh respondents were surveyed uh you know uh or asean was surveyed as to you know, if you were to be forced to align itself with one of the strategic rivals, US or China, what would it choose? And for the first time, uh, China came out on top. Uh, of course, this was just 50.5% of the survey respondents who have had 
uh, say that you know ASEAN should align with with China instead of the U.S. But this was still a bit of a rise from previous years. Uh, now, having said that, you know it is. Uh, I think Southeast Asia is at uh, a point where it's trying to balance its interests between U.S. and China, each of which are offering very different things uh, to to Southeast Asia as a well. whole. With some a little bit more of a military reassurance, with others, uh, with China, for instance, uh, economic interest. So I think it's uh, going to continue uh, trying to balance those interests um, and ultimately also still push for an open and rule-based uh, international uh, order. Yeah. Uh, so we have one more question in the Q&A from Earl Carr. Uh, what types of companies and industry sectors within Singapore's economy would be interested in possibly investing in the Arctic? Uh, shipbuilding, uh, in the past, uh, oil rigs, uh, in the past, Singapore has also built some icebreakers. Uh, we are quite involved in, with the Norwegians on some of the maritime engineering projects. Um, I think port management, if opportunities come about, uh, I think quite, quite, basically infrastructure development um that that's what i can think of for now uh hima do you have anything to add uh i think that's that's mostly it's infrastructure development uh port shipbuilding uh these are really the things that singapore does excel at and it seems to that that's what its its value is at is as well so that's mostly then uh i think there has been some interest in the past on telecommunications, but that hasn't really translated across yet. Um, yeah, it's mostly ship and, and, and port management. Marisol Maddox uh, from the Wilson Center about uh, the, there was a survey that, that was published recently that seemed to show ASEAN uh, siding more with China uh, on, and although there's been some criticism of that survey. So uh, th this is a question for you, Hima. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think the main drivers are behind that survey? Yeah, that was the, uh, the ISIS uh, survey outlook that I mentioned earlier. So it was really, a, I, I believe, again, it was 50.5% that was uh, where countries were a bit more aligned with China. Um, so it wasn't a, a huge majority, but... I think a lot of it has to do with the fact of, and this is not just Singapore, but the rest of the Southeast Asian states, which are developing their economies very, very quickly, and therefore also inviting a lot of investments coming in from China. So as I mentioned, with, with a lot of countries, they look to the US for mil more, uh, military engagement, uh, you know, whether it's with the Philippines or with uh, you know, countries like Indonesia, for instance. Uh, and a lot of other countries are really deepening their economic engagements with China, which has been heavily investing in the region as well. So that might be one driver for that that uh, shift as well. Uh, so um, Mark uh, Lantain had a question that I asked him to save, but why not have it now? If you, uh, Mark? Hey, thank you. Um, really enjoying the dialogue. I just had a very quick question about the current state of the Arctic Council. Now, because it is obviously not operating at full capacity, there's a lot of concern over whether um, the business of the council, especially the working groups, will be able to get anywhere near close to previous capacity. I was just wondering if you can comment about how that affects Singapore's specific interests in the council, especially via the working groups, because obviously the situation has changed drastically since 2022. Thanks. Mm. Um, I was actually attending some of the sustainable development working group uh, sessions when they were discussing projects and whatnot. And uh, since the war, that was suspended. Um, and it's quite a pity, but I didn't really follow what the Singapore government has said. But if I recall correctly, basically we are taking a uh, sort of, um, we are waiting for the Arctic Council members themselves to make a decision, right? Again, 
We are just observers. We are very, very mindful of our position. We don't give our opinions unless they ask for it. So we defer to them and we will see and abide by whatever the council decides to do. In terms of affecting uh, our engagement, uh, perhaps some of the Arctic Council projects may have been disrupted. Uh, but I think at the bilateral level, Arctic engagement with Arctic member states still continue. Like uh, I just read in the papers, I think it was sometime earlier this year or last year, the Earth Observatory in Singapore, they are sending students uh, to Norway to partake in some Arctic uh, um, research projects. So there are still a lot of bilateral uh, engagement with Arctic Council member states. But with regards to the Arctic Council, uh, we are taking very much, I suppose, a wait and see approach. And when there are events, we do send our ministers there or our special representatives, and you can find their speeches online. Uh, but basically now, uh, we are just waiting to see what the members have to say. Yeah, and, and just to add on to that, I think that's uh, something that I think uh, Singapore has done well in it. it didn't just engage with uh, within the Arctic Council through its working groups. From the time it, it became an observer, it's been engaging both within the Arctic Council working groups as well as outside of it. So we know that, you know, a lot of Arctic conversations take place in through various uh, conferences and platforms and, and what have you, whether it's Arctic Frontiers, Arctic Circle, bilateral engagements, and it's all these other platforms that it's been very actively attending and, and, and uh, contributing to that has also provided it a means of uh, continued engagement despite uh, things slowing down within the Arctic Council. Mm. So uh, please join me in thanking our two panelists for an excellent discussion uh, in this public uh, session of uh, our dialogue on Singapore, Canada, the US and the Arctic. I express respect in the expert panel, we'll talk more about uh, the Canada US piece. Um, I hope uh, you also agree with me that Singapore plays a very fascinating and underreported role in the Arctic and uh, is uh, contributing in many ways. And uh, I think I thank our panelists for calling attention to this and uh, to show what an outsized role a small country um, many thousands of miles away from the Arctic region can, can play. So thank you to them and thank you to the University of Alaska Fairbanks and to the East West Center for uh, sponsoring this program.